I'd, I'd like to just share with you some of my takeaways from that experience um, because I think it's another way in which we're seeing a, a capability being built to wage the war of ideas and to have the kind of education of the public, the electorate, uh, the people of this country that I talked about at the beginning uh, take, a, take place. But, but before I get into that, I just want to share with you something that is really instructive about the problem we're up against. Uh, this is going to be the subject of a new book that we will have coming out here shortly, I hope in January, um, entitled Know Your Rights, Journalism in the Age of Islamist Lawfare. And it is, a, it is a set of guidelines that were issued back about three weeks after 9-11 by the Society of Professional Journalists. And I'm going to skip around just to pick up some of the real nuggets of it, but uh, these give you a some sense of what the problem is with the media that Andrew is busily destroying. For example, one of the guidelines with respect to stories is, quote, cover the victims of harassment, murder, and other hate crimes as thoroughly as you cover the victims of terrorist attacks. Um, when writing about terrorism, remember to include white supremacist, radical, anti-abortionists, and other groups with a history of such activities. Avoid using terms such as jihad unless you are certain of the precise meaning and include the context that are used in quotations. The basic meaning of jihad is to exert oneself for the good of Islam and to better oneself. See Steve Coughlin on this subject if you uh, need any further clarification. Um, ask men and women from within targeted communities to review your coverage and make suggestions. By targeted, uh, they mean, of course, the enemy. Specifically, consult the Library of Congress guide for transliteration of Arabic names and Muslim or Arab words to the Roman alphabet. Use spellings, get this, use spellings preferred by the American Muslim Council, such as including Muhammad, Quran, Mecca, not Mecca. Now, why that's particularly interesting is at the time this was written, the American Muslim Council was arguably the preeminent Muslim Brotherhood front in the United States of America. It was run by a fellow by the name of Abdurrahman Alamudi at the time, Alamudi being um, the same individual who was entrusted by Bill Clinton with the responsibility to select chaplains for the United States military and prison system. Abdurrahman Alamudi is currently serving time in federal prison for 23 years as the leading Al-Qaeda financier and active terrorist operative. So that's not good. And the idea that we want to make sure we defer to targeted communities like the Muslim Brotherhood is sort of, well, it's not only illustrative of the larger problem that we're up against, because this is pretty much the set of guidelines the US government <laughs> follows too, as is documented extensively in the book that we have outside for you, Sharia, The Threat to America. And I apologize, by the way, I offered that for free and I was told afterwards that actually we're charging a nominal $10, but um, we hope you'll pick it up and read it anyway. The point being, these are the sorts of guidelines that manifestly circumscribe the kind of reporting that we can get on a subject that is as material to our survival as any. And I think if you were actually to 
to drill down, you would find that most professional journalists, not all, certainly we had some in the previous panel who would this not be true of, but most journalists are following, even in the absence of such guidance, similar kinds of constraints, self-imposed constraints. Now, what I've taken away from my limited exposure to the new media is several things that are really important in thinking about how we can actually overcome this sort of behavior. Uh, one is clearly, it is now the case that with the proliferation and sharply diminishing costs of technology, practically anybody can be in the news business. As Andrew says, when sort of Drudge set himself up in it, it drove these guys crazy. It's only gotten worse as more and more and more folks are now capable of producing video, as well as, of course, blogging and even publishing, um, moving ideas to huge audiences around the world in real time. Think about it. An incredibly empowering thing. It is happening faster, too. People are now expecting virtually instantaneous reporting on everything. The 24-hour news, news cycle is reflective of the fact that it's, you know, a full day, obviously, but it's, it's nanoseconds, really, that people are anticipating there will be somebody either informing them or helping them understand what has just happened, just happened. There is a, an intimacy to the kind of information that is now available, the kind of interactivity that we've come to take for granted in terms of the extent to which somebody is reporting and you're able to give them feedback on their reporting. A very different kind of model than, you know, the faceless people who read newspapers and maybe if they bestir themselves and maybe if they're lucky enough, some editor will say, well, publish your letter after a while. We've had grassroots organizations. I mean, I, I really can't conceive of the Tea Party movement, for example, having happened without the alternative media to inform them, to organize them, to disseminate their ideas in this non-centralized way. I mean, that's really the genius of both the Tea Parties and this alternative uh, news capability. There's niche marketing. As people become more and more able to determine what they want in terms of news, people are serving it up to them in a very tailored way. Unfortunately, I mean, we're here to celebrate some of the positive things for the good guys, if I may use that term. George Soros has figured this out too. And you look at ProPublica and uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting and other outlets like that, who by the way, thanks to in part his money and thanks in part to the cutbacks that we've just been talking about in terms of the mainstream legacy media are now putting ProPublica's investigative reporting directly into the New York Times and into the NPRs and into you know, the CNNs for the purposes of essentially mainstreaming, mainlining that left-wing agitation and uh, uh, disinformation in some cases. Much of it, by the way, having a distinctly anti-military tilt to it. Let me just conclude by saying, uh, in terms of filling the void, uh, one of the things that I've been just thrilled to be able to participate in, and I want to take a moment to thank particularly the folks on our staff at the Center for Security Policy who are teaching me most of this and leading the way on it, uh, particularly our COO, Christine Brim, who I think if you haven't met her, she's here somewhere. <clears throat> 
David Raboy, who is at the moment handling camera work, but is the genius behind all of this. Adam Savitt, who is his understudy. Um, and Nick Hanlon, who has been doing just a tremendous job on uh, productions of, uh, of the radio show that we do. These folks are showing that even a small organization like ours, with lots of intellectual capital and content, can play an outsized role in the war of ideas, thanks to the alternative or new media. Let me just touch on a couple of these things. I, I mentioned publishing, of course, in addition to the book that we have out today and the book we have out uh, in January on uh, journalism. Steve Coughlin is going to uh, hopefully finish up a very important distillation of the extraordinary, yeah, raise your hand, Steve Coughlin, over there in the, there you are, stand up, that's even better. Steve has been doing for several years now, since he left uh, under some duress, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, if you don't know that story, it's an interesting one. He was banished from the Pentagon. Bill Gertz did a marvelous job reporting this in the Washington Times. And I'm glad to actually put these guys in the same room. I think uh, Bill thinks this is the first time he's met uh, Steve in person. But Bill did a lot to help put the national security spotlight on a guy who was being driven out of the Pentagon by an agent of the Muslim Brotherhood who was working there for the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Just another example, and there's lots more in the book, of the penetration and influence operations of the United States government. In a place where you saw it actually, you know, a more legacy medium uh, helping to uh, raise the profile of this. Steve is going to be putting together a book that will distill his tremendous briefings, and uh, I really commend this to you. But here we are, we're publishing this ourselves through the miracle of Amazon, uh, a tremendous vehicle as, as this book was published. Um, as I mentioned, we are doing a syndicated radio program. Uh, this is a, a constant miracle to me. Uh, I do it every weeknight. It's broadcast on the Salem Radio Network's outlet in Washington and in Portland, Oregon. We say coast to coast. Um, we're just filling out the rest of the country at the moment, uh, hoping to get something going here in New York. But think about it. This is being basically done on a Macintosh with a microphone. And uh, our superb folks back in the, in the center have figured out how to produce the film, uh, the videos, and, and get them out. David Raboy has been doing some marvelous work on, I'm getting the cane too, now here and <laughs> Turnabout is fair play. Uh, David has been producing videos. We have a CSP TV. It doesn't begin to compare to a PJ TV, pajamas TV, but it is, again, another force multiplier for those of us who were working in the national security space. Um, incredibly powerful. Blogging, Facebook, Twitter, uh, these are all things that uh, we're doing as well. But I want to say, in closing, just a, a special word of thanks to my friend Andrew Breitbart, because um, he took it upon himself as part of his um, total war against the mainstream media to augment the Breitbart empire media empire uh, that is just, you know, a sheer miracle. Um, starting, I think, with uh, big Hollywood, and uh, then big journalism, and then big government. Big government got uh, probably the most celebrity for his marvelous takedown of Acorn. But, uh, <laughs> but on the 4th of July of this year, appropriately enough, Andrew Breitbart uh, allowed us to go forward together in what he calls BigPeace.com. And Big Peace, with uh, the participation of Peter Schweitzer as its editor-in-chief, and uh, a great fellow by the name of Jim Hansen from uh, the Black5.net mill bloggers, and I don't know, probably over a hundred now contributors, if not a great deal more, um, has developed into a go-to web portal for the sorts of things that we care about. A place where we can routinely push out 
ideas and information and commentaries and otherwise tie in the videos and the other work that uh, so many of us are doing that might not otherwise ever see the light of day. Certainly not to anything remotely like the kind of audiences that, uh, that routinely tune to Breitbart's various uh, operations. And that's the last thing that I just want to say. What Andrew specifically has done, and I think Roger has done in his way too, is appreciate that the real power of these new media is the opportunity they present to pull together. And what we have done on occasion, and uh, Andrew's got a live fire exercise going on right now that sort of tangentially on the, uh, on the national security space, and he can explain that to you if you'd like, but it's, it's a tremendously important story. And he's broken it, he's developed it, and he's got the various elements of the big piece empire. I mean, William Randolph Hearst would be envious, actually, of this empire, if you think about it. Uh, on the Pigfoot story and how this scandal is really emblematic of what is wrong with the kind of big government that uh, Barack Obama is associated with. And I, I just want to say, by swarming these various outlets and engines uh, on these issues, um, he can take the kind of breakthrough pioneering work that he and Matt Drudge did 15 years on, and make this into a real force for good at a time when, as I think we all appreciate, it is more needed than ever. So to the extent that a small organization like ours can be made vastly more effective and capable of influencing all of these things by our partnerships with uh, the folks here and, and so many others in the new media, um, it's, it's just a, a brave new world for all of us, and we hope to make it a more safe and secure one for America. So thank you.